Can I be raw for just a second? Can I be real for just a moment here? It has been a rough couple of weeks. It's been an emotional couple of weeks for me. So be warned. I may get a little twitchy up here. I may be a little bit all over the place tonight. So you're not 100% sure which tone you're going to get. Okay? So just roll with me. So, but before I get too lost in that, I need to uh, introduce my inspiration and some of my, my co-teachers for the evening. I believe we have a video for them, if we will roll that for just a moment here real quick. Who are the Mythbusters? Adam Savage. I'm done with science for today. And Jamie Heineman. Way to go there, buddy. Between them, more than 30 years of special effects experience. Joining them, Grant Imahara. That's why we can never have anything nice. Tori Bellici. I'll try not to let you guys down. And Carrie Byron. Oh! You know, I went to college for this. They don't just tell the myths, they put them to the test. Right. So if you didn't know what the Mythbusters were joining us tonight, who in here has seen the Mythbusters ever before? Yes? No, there are a few of you. I watched the Mythbusters probably every week from about sixth grade to sophomore year of high school. And I watched the, like, the show came on Discovery. It came on Wednesday nights at 7. And some of you are thinking that's oddly specific that after all these years you remember that time frame. And there's a reason for that because when I was your age... Back when dinosaurs roamed the earth, you rode to school on a horse, in a world before COVID, but it was also a world before Netflix. Somebody passed out in the front row up here, I think. And so you had to, this is a foreign idea, you had to remember the day and time that your show came on. Because if you missed the show... You missed it. You were waiting like weeks before you saw that episode. And there's like, then it's like, I missed episode number three. They're going to show number four next week. And I have to wait. I'll see like 10 others before you see three again. So I have no idea what they're talking about if they reference the last one. That's what it was like. So I was always watching that show. And if you've not seen the show, what they would do was this team of people would gather together and they would test urban legends and myths using science and high explosives, which is probably why I watched the show. But I, I'm invoking them tonight, I'm bringing them up tonight because we're in this series called Disciples, and we've talked about what a disciple is and how to be a disciple, and tonight we're talking about how to make disciples. And there's a lot of myths and misconceptions about that process. For instance, we tend to think that you have to be older. All eyes on Papa B. You have to be older before you can disciple people. We, we tend to think that you have to have the entire Bible memorized from beginning to end before you can disciple somebody. Or that you have to have your life all together. There's no mistakes, no struggles. Everything's good with you before you can disciple somebody else. But the Bible proves those myths false. Well, first off, so I've gotten out of order for a second. When we, so when we imagine all of that, we, we close our eyes and we envision somebody that's supposed to be discipling people. We close our eyes and we envision someone older with a, with a beard and a wizened face weathered by experience. And no, no, no. That's Gandalf the White. My bad. But these are myths. The Bible proves them false. Josiah, Jeremiah, and Timothy were all younger than the people they were called to disciple. You don't have to be older to disciple. You need to be mature. But maturity is not a number. It's a characteristic. It's not an age. It's a process. You don't have to have the entire Bible memorized. Peter and John, two of Jesus' disciples that go on to disciple others and found the church, were, well, they were fishermen. And they were fishermen because they didn't finish school, so they didn't know 
everything, but they get brought before the Pharisees, the guys that went all the way through, that actually had parts of the Bible memorized. And they have to, they're put on trial in front of these guys. And the Bible gives us their opinion on Peter and John. It's polite. It, it translates as they looked at them and saw that they were untrained or uneducated. The actual Greek word is where we get the word idiot from, but that's kind of what they thought of them. But they opened their mouths and give this defense of the gospel in Jesus so well that these guys don't know what to say. These educated guys don't have a rebuttal. And they note that the only thing that these guys had to their name was that they had been with Jesus. That was all that was required to disciple. And if you're looking for somebody in the Bible that discipled somebody else that had it all together, there's only one person. That would be Jesus. Everybody else, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David, they all had issues. Elijah, the prophet Elijah, has this great victory that he wins. Okay, and after his greatest victory, he suffers a nervous breakdown runs away and is so depressed that he wants to die. But it's in that season of life that God comes to him and tells him, I want you to get up and go disciple this guy named Elisha. Now you're going to have to work with me here because we're going we're to stay with the story of Elijah and his disciple Elisha. And I may get their names confused because they're kind of close, but it's Ja and Sha, Elijah and Elisha. And we're staying with their story because it's an excellent illustration of these myths and how they look to, because it looks to confirm the myths on the surface, but when you get down underneath of it, it's exposing them as false. For instance, the one that I just gave. When you looked at Elijah, he was a prophet. He's a man of God. So he probably did have his Bible memorized, at least the first five books, pretty good. And he probably had the beard, okay? That prerequisites, check, check. But this whole thing about not having struggles, no. Elijah had some issues. And yet, God used him to disciple others. So, in their story, we're going to use it to bust three main myths when it comes to discipling others. The first one is who we're supposed to disciple, how we initiate the process of discipleship, and then what it looks like to disciple someone else. So, we'll pick up right where we started here. The Lord said to Elijah... Go back the way you came and go to the desert of Damascus. When you get there, anoint Hazael, king of Aram. Be warned, I will not say all these names right. Also, anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi. Say Nimshi with me. Nimshi. It sounds like something out of a Japanese anime rather than a Hebrew name, but it's cool. Nimshi, king over Israel. And anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, or Snapchat, I think somebody said earlier. From, here's the hard one, Abel Mahala. That sounds a little Hawaiian, if I'm honest. To succeed you as prophet. Now, most the myth when it comes to who we're supposed to disciple looks a lot like what we see here. We, we, we see God giving this divine calling, speaking from heaven to Elijah, that you're going to go over there and disciple this guy named Elisha. And that's how it usually works. We think that before we, that in order to disciple the person, God's going to reveal to, this, to us who they are from heaven and that they're usually going to be over there. There being another country, there being somewhere, you know, in an inner city setting, there somewhere way over there. Hopefully there might have like a tropical beach somewhere, but that's there. That's where we think it's supposed to be. And on the surface, that's what it looks like. And it's not to say that those places don't need someone to come and disciple people there. But when you actually look at the people that God just assigned him, these weren't strangers 
to Elijah. Hazael was second in charge of the kingdom of, of Aram. He's heard of the guy. And he doesn't have to go find him. He's on his way to Damascus, and he meets him on the road and anoints him as king. God places him in his way. Jehu, Jehu, everybody knew about Jehu, because Jehu, despite that name, was one scary dude, okay? He's one bad dude. And if you ask him, like, was he bad as in cool, or was he bad as in bad, the answer is yes. You did not get crossways with Jehu, and everybody knew who he was, but he's on the way to go take out the current king of Israel, because that's what he's going to go do. He, the king's asking the watchman, who is that approaching in the chariot? And the guy goes, I don't know, but he drives like Jehu. He drives like a madman. So it's safe to say that Elijah probably knew who this guy was. And then Elisha, he's specific about who this guy is. It's this Elisha from this family in this town. And he's talking about people that Elijah knows about. Because God wasn't speaking to Elijah from way up here. It wasn't this out of the clouds voice talking to him. God was talking to him right here. Early in the chapter, he's talking to him in a gentle whisper. And so he was doing the same thing with each one of these people. He was not telling Elijah to go out there. He was bringing those people here. He was placing Elisha in particular right here. If you're wondering who you're supposed to be discipling, look around you. God places, he is deliberately placing people in your lives with the intention of you discipling them. So look around you. That may be a friend, that may be a classmate, that may be a teammate, that may be the person you sit next to at lunch or in the band hall. Some of you you go home with them. Some of you, that is your sibling. And they have been placed in your life for you to disciple. My mom disciples young women. And one of the young women that she has discipled over the years is named Salem Cook. And she too is a discipler of people. As a matter of fact, she's really good about discipling the people that are around her at any given point in time. She discipled her teammates. She discipled her boyfriend. But the most important person that she has ever discipled are her siblings. She has discipled them in what it means to be a Christian. If you're looking for who to disciple, look around you. Because God has placed them somewhere around you. Second myth is how do we, how do we go and disciple people? How do we do that? And the problem, the myth with this is it's either going to be awkward or really grand. And again, it, this kind of illustrates this. So it says that Elijah went from there and found Elisha, son of Shaphat. And he was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen, and he himself was driving the 12th pair. Elijah went up to him and threw his cloak around him. So here's the awkward part. It plays out in two ways. You have this awkward moment where Elisha's just minding his own business. He's working, and this creepy old guy comes up behind him and puts his cloak on him. Okay, that's the awkward moment. We, we have this deal of like, what? How, we're asked to disciple people, so what do we do? And we go up to that person and like, hey, um, can I disciple you? And they're going to look at you like, no, because that's really weird. Social distancing, please. Thank you. Okay. That's a myth. The other end of the, is this idea of this grand gesture. Elijah sees Elisha down the hill, and he comes down there, and the epic music kicks on in the background, and he takes this huge moment and places it, his mantle on Elisha's shoulders, and he knows that he is being called to be a disciple to this guy. But and to be honest, there, there is a point for grandness in discipling somebody. I am a huge 
fan of rites of passage, about making moments. I mean, for crying out loud, some of the guys that I disciple, I literally knight them. I bring them in. They, I have my big old Lord of the Rings sword that I carry around. They take a knee. I give them an oath. I slap them in the face and tell them that's so they remember it. And then I dub them and tell them I rise at night. There, there's a place for that. But that's not where it starts. It starts with, hey, you want to get lunch? Hey, what you doing this weekend? Let's hang out. Let's go do something. It starts off with, what are you doing Sunday after church? Come up here to the church or to OC or wherever we're gathering, and we're going to play dead body and run around like crazy for a little bit. Discipleship starts by inviting people into your life. It is not so much a follow me as it is a walk with me. It starts when we let people into our lives and allow them to share in it. That is where discipleship begins. And so, the third myth is this circulating around this idea of, well, what does discipling people look like? What is the process? Do we sit down and we read a book together? Well, maybe. Do we teach them the Roman road? Does anybody in here know that? Because I don't remember it either. Ah, okay, we do have somebody. Does it look like a Bible? So, yes, and that's a part of it too. But the best, the best way to break this myth is to look at Elisha's reaction to being called to be a disciple. So it says that after Elijah puts his cloak on him, it says that Elisha then left his oxen, ran after Elijah, and said, let me kiss my father and my mother goodbye. And he said, and then I will come with you. And Elijah goes, go back. And he replied, what have I done to you? So Elijah left him, went back, took his yoke of oxen, slaughtered them. He burned the plow and equipment to cook the meat and gave it to the people, and they ate. Then he set out to follow Elijah and become his servant. That is a disproportionate response to an old creepy guy that put his cloak on you. That does not make sense. Because the reality is, is when, I, when it was said earlier that Elisha was the owner of 12 sets of oxen and plows, that's the ye olde way. That's the Old Testament way of saying that Elisha's got money. He's living a comfortable life. He's lived a prosperous life. He's got a lot of land, a lot of property. He makes a lot of money. And yet he just basically said, I'm going to go kiss my mom and dad goodbye. And he takes all that prosperity, everything that he's built his life for, and sets that on fire and goes after Elijah. And it gets even crazier because later on, when Elijah's about to go to heaven, and when I say that, that does not mean that he's about to die. Elijah doesn't die. Elijah gets an Uber ride from heaven to heaven. Okay, He gets scooped up and taken to heaven. But before he goes, he looks at Elisha and says, what can I give to you as an inheritance? Elisha's response was, I want a double portion of your spirit. What does that mean? This guy's making no sense. But there's two things that are explained by that. The first one is this, that when it came to this inheritance thing, in Hebrew culture, the oldest son received a double portion of the inheritance. If there were five kids, the, other, the, the younger four got one portion, but the oldest got two. So what happened right there is as a father, Elisha offered an inheritance, and Elisha claimed the right of a firstborn son. Discipleship drew them closer. It became a relationship that was like family. That's what it was there for. But what with the double portion? Why the spirit? Why is he asking that? Why, why, this, why did he leave everything that he had going for him and chase after this guy? 
because Elisha saw how Elijah lived. Both the miraculous and the mundane. He saw how he lived in public and in private. He saw the intimacy he had with people and the intimacy he had with God. And he looked at it and said, I want that. I want it twice. I want what you have and double it. He wanted the life that Elijah had gotten to live. How do we disciple people? The best way to disciple people is to live like a disciple and to model what that looks like to others. I had a buddy in high school, his name was Zach Knight. And Zach was the life of the party. He was a cool guy, he was an athlete, he was a cool guy, he was popular, he was welcome wherever he wanted to go. There wasn't a clique he wasn't allowed to be a part of, there wasn't a party he couldn't get into. He was a cool guy. The thing was, the confusing thing, was he didn't act how the popular guys acted. He didn't do the things that were usually prerequisites to be popular. He didn't cuss. He didn't drink. He didn't smoke. He didn't sleep around. He didn't deal with pornography. He didn't talk like guys did in the locker room. And yeah, uh, he was a Christian. I mean, I was a Christian, and I still struggle with lust, and I still talk like a sailor. On a bad day, sometimes I might still have to deal with that. But he had all that popularity. He fit in with everybody, but he didn't do the normal stuff to fit in. And on top of that, he was always fun. He had this joy that was inside of him. He was always at peace. In the most stressful situations, Zach was always at peace. And he had this confidence, this self-assuredness that he lived with. You, you could not bully the guy because he just, you try and make fun of him and he'd laugh at it and then crack a joke right after it. You couldn't get under the guy's skin. And I'm sitting there wondering what the difference is because I was massively insecure, over-competitive, short-tempered, ashamed of the things I struggled with. And I wanted to know what the difference was. So I started hanging around this guy. What's the deal? And what I found out was he wasn't just Christian in name. He wasn't just a believer. Because I know I was that guy and I had known other guys and they turned out to be hypocrites. But Zach wasn't that. Zach was a disciple. Zach just didn't, he didn't just go to church. He participated in worship. He jumped around. He led it. He didn't just read his Bible when he had to in Sunday school. No, he was reading that at home, studying it, and then taking parts of it and applying it to his life. And because of that, he bore the fruit of a disciple, that peace, that confidence, that joy. And I looked at that and I wanted it. I only watched Mythbusters until my sophomore year. Because one day Zach looked at me and said, hey, you want to go to church? You want to come to youth group? Youth group was at Wednesday, 7 o'clock. And I jumped in. I started reading my Bible because Zach was reading his. And I wanted to know, one, what he had found, and two, what it was Christians actually believed. And that started because he did that. He found out that I was trying to get into casting crowns, which is ye olde worship music. And he found that out, and he goes, let me get you hooked up. And he took, his, he took my iPod, which is 
for those of you who don't know, what, was, uh, what we had before there were iPhones. It's like an iPhone, but you can't call people on it. But you can't play music. He took it and through his dark magic of computer hacking, I don't know how he got his playlist on my phone for free, but we don't ask questions about that. But he, he gave me his worship list. He modeled what it was to be a disciple. And because of how he lived, I'm here now. There's a last myth. There's a myth that a lot of us believe that we cannot disciple, that we do not have influence to do so. That our lives don't matter. We moved to Canada in my fifth grade year. And before recess of fifth grade, teacher comes in and says, you're going to recess and the fourth grader is going to be out there with you. So what you do, they're going to do. Set a good example. You roll into the next year. Sixth grade went to school with the, the, the fourth and the fifth graders. Sixth graders in the room, stand up, please, if there are any. Stand up on your feet, okay? Yeah, we got some few in here. Now, I realize that y'all probably, yeah, stay standing for me, okay? Y'all don't get to sit down. Y'all probably go to school with the seventh and eighth graders, but the reality of it is, is those people that are younger than you, whether they're family friends, whether they're your own siblings, whether they are people at those, in those actual grades at another school, they're watching you. They're watching to see how you live. What you think is cool, they're going to think is cool. And the people that are older than you, they're watching you too. They want to know what you're willing to do. They're watching to see how you react. You have influence. Seventh graders, on your feet. Now, sixth graders, stay standing. Sixth graders, you get to stay standing. Seventh graders, on your feet, okay? Because all the people that were standing, seventh graders, they're watching you. Because you got to step into the next phase of life. You're getting to actually compete for schools. You're getting to actually do stuff like that. And what you think is cool, they're going to think is cool. What you do, they're going to do. Eighth graders, stand on up. Join us. Because guess what? Look around. The people that are standing, they're watching you. You are the height of junior high. You are the top dog, right? You are trendsetters. What you do, other people are going to do. What you think cool, they're going to think is cool. Ninth graders, where you at? Stand up. Now, there's that transition from being 8th to ninth grade, and you feel like you've become the, the bottom of the totem pole, but the reality of it is, is all those junior hires that I just had stand up, by the time the 6th graders reach that second semester, they want to be in your shoes as soon as possible. They want to be in high school, and they're watching you. They're watching how you handle it. They're watching what habits you take up, and what you do they're going to do. Tenth graders, where you at? On your feet. Look around. Because you're at the phase now where they're not just going to watch what you do publicly. They start to learn what you do privately when none of the adults are watching. And what you do in private, they're going to do in public. What you do, they'll do. What you say is cool, they'll think is cool. 11th graders. we got most of the room standing up, but 11th graders, get on your feet. Because everybody else that was standing is watching you. They're watching how you, what you're going to do next. They're watching what you do in private, because that's going to make an impact on what they do in public. How you talk they're going to talk. What you do, they're going to do. How you live is going to impact somebody else further down the food chain. Seniors on your feet, 12th graders. 12th grade was the one year that you did not have to really get the speech. Especially if you were a guy on the football 
the varsity football team. Because your Fridays in the fall were spent hanging out in New Jersey last period with all the little kids in elementary school. And they dressed up like you. And they worshipped the ground that you walked on. Whether you were a cheerleader, whether you were in that band, it doesn't matter what you were. The oldest person in the room was the coolest person around. And what you did, they would do. What you thought was cool, they were going to do. What you did in private, they were going to do in public. What you did in moderation, they were going to do in excess. So when you stepped into a prep rally and saw this room filled with everyone from preschool to senior, there was no denying that people were watching. And how you lived mattered. Like it or not, you have power. You have influence. You can bring life or you can bring death. You can use that influence to change somebody's life for the better or destroy it. Because they're watching. How you live matters to somebody else. Not just today, it can matter a hundred years from now because you're setting trends. You're setting what's cool, what's acceptable. How you live your life matters eternally to somebody else. You have power. Don't waste it. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for who you are. We thank you that you loved us enough to bring us into life that is full. That you came down here and showed us what that is. That you have always guided us and provided for us a life that is worth living. God, I pray now that you would turn our hearts to you and to the desire to bring others with us as we go after you. Open our eyes to the people you've placed in our lives that we may love on them well, that we may model for them what it means to be loved by you and to love you. Give us favor in their eyes. May we be tools in your hands to make an impact in somebody else's life.